Welcome to CBC Windsor News at 6. I'm Meg Roberts. Thanks so much for spending part of your evening with us tonight. Amjanong First Nation in Sarnia is calling on all levels of government to shut down a nearby facility. The First Nation says it's emitting harmful chemicals into the air, leading to complaints of headaches and dizziness. Plus more reaction to the federal budget. There are plans for the former HMCS Hunter site and the federal government hopes that involves housing. And do you remember the smelt run? We have footage from Point Pelee in the early spring as hundreds descended on the area to catch the little silver fish. More reaction tonight on the federal budget. The former HMCS Hunter building on Olette Avenue may soon become housing. It's one of the surplus properties the federal government is unloading to create almost 4 million new homes. The CBC's Dale Molnar has more. The former HMCS Hunter Naval Building Armories on Olette Avenue has sat vacant for almost 10 years after a new facility was built in Sandwich Town. It was one of several surplus Department of National Defense properties identified in Tuesday's budget. The feds say they will either sell them or lease them to developers to create new housing. We want to get that property into the hands of developers uh, and not-for-profit organizations as quickly as possible. We're talking months and, and months not years. Downtown area resident Reno Bordelin is in favor of the plan. I mean, I think you saw the feds commit to using federal lands, underused lands, ones that have been converted uh, for housing, and I think it should be done across the country, which they are. Um, I think the, the key will be in the details of how fast they can move on these properties. The chair of the downtown Windsor BIA is also a developer. This project is too big for him, but he is going to encourage other developers to take advantage of it. You know, there's lots of multi-story uh, buildings around it, uh, so I think it would be prime for redevelopment. You know, from the downtown perspective, I think it is awesome. Whenever we can get property from a non-useful into residential, it's going to be great for our downtown. So we were super excited to hear that announcement from the government yesterday as part of the budget. So one of the things we're looking at, if it makes sense, to actually lease the property, a long-term lease. Think about, let's say, 99-year lease. Um, where, where what that would do, what that would accomplish, is it would take the cost of land procurement out of the equation. Kuzmierczyk says the government will create a federal surplus council that will look at thousands of federal properties to see which ones to lease or sell. Um, and we're also going to be going out and looking for uh, partners to come to the table to say, yep, tomorrow I can get shovels in the ground, I can build affordable housing uh, here uh, as quickly as possible. Because this is a national housing crisis, we recognize it, we want to get housing built as soon as possible. It's not clear when the federal government will either lease or sell off the HMCS Hunter property. Dale Molnar, CBC News, Windsor. Social media is filled with support and condolences for a 21-year-old Chatham man, Craig Spence. He died in a car crash yesterday. OPP were called to a crash on Highway 401 just south of London yesterday around 3 p.m. Police say a transport truck and pickup truck had collided. The driver of the pickup truck was pronounced dead at the scene. Spence was known by many as the captain of the Blenheim Blades, a junior C hockey team. General manager of the team, Bob Price, got a call from police while they were at the scene. Price tells CBC News Spence was a great role model on and off the ice. The team's banquet was scheduled for this Friday. Spence was set to receive two awards for his accomplishments. Members of a First Nation near Sarnia want a plastic plant shut down. Am Janong's chief and council say harmful emissions are making people sick and are calling for urgent government action. The CBC's Chris Ensing joins me now. Chris, what are people telling you today? Uh, yeah, Meg, uh, I've been told plastic, this plant is putting profits before people, that the federal and provincial government have not listened to years of advocacy work and that the people of Amjanong First Nation are paying the price of that with their health. And this all centers on benzene emissions that the First Nation blames on the plant that creates chemicals for plastic. Now that plant is located right across from the band office and from a playground. I'm just going to give you a quick little show here. So this is a brand new playground, new area, baseball diamonds over there. Uh, the band office behind me, some other offices here as well. And then you can see uh, the plant actually right there. And it's that plant that they believe uh, is emitting high levels, extremely high levels of benzene emissions. And they say that that's creating poor air quality. Let's show you an example of what an air monitoring station shows. It's located just behind me 
as happened this week. Benzene is a harmful toxin. It can cause cancer. Multiple people, they left work from the band office yesterday feeling sick. I spoke with one person who went to hospital. They said they got blood work taken. They're at home now. Their throat is itchy. They feel nauseous. They have headaches. They believe it's related uh, to what was exposed to those emissions uh, that occurred earlier this week. Those emissions now, they're in a greener area here. That's why we're standing outside here right now. Uh, but there's a belief that it's creating a sickness amongst people who live inside of this area. And it's about that benzene exposure. And that, they believe, comes from an Ineos plant. Now, council wants that plant to be shut down. And they want it reopened after safety inspections. The site manager sat that plant said to us today in a statement that they're reviewing recent data and that they strive to make sure that they meet regulations by the Ontario government when it comes to those emissions. The problem, Meg, is that people here tell me that the emission standards are not good enough and that's what they want to see changed as well. Chris, what is the federal and the provincial government doing about this? Meg, they met with Van Council today, and in that meeting that wrapped up this afternoon, I'm told that Council reiterated the demands that the facility be shut down. Previous studies and reports that have been released by the provincial government have identified benzene as a risk to people living in this area. There's studies and reports that say people in Sarnia and the Amjanon First Nation have uh, higher rates of asthma. Uh, that, that's been reported out a, a couple of years ago as well. I'm told that what people want to see is action and they want to see this place known as Chemical Valley in this area have more emission targets or reductions in place. The federal government earlier this year announced a plan yeah. to create draft regulations for these types of harmful chemicals. People have until April 24th to submit those thoughts. People I spoke with today though, Meg, said they want urgent action, that they've been screaming at the top of their lungs and feel like they're being ignored. Meg. Thanks so much for that, Chris. That's the CBC's Chris Ensing reporting live. Call it. It looks like that thunderstorm has cleared up now here in Windsor, but boy, did it come down a couple hours ago. Yeah, and some of that active weather still in southwestern Ontario as it's carrying on to the east. So kind of breaking it down for you, we do still have a severe thunderstorm watch that's in play because of the risk of these severe storms, but obviously most of it uh, now to the east of Windsor. There's still a little bit of cell development. See, right there. Um, so still a few things uh, to watch. This is the main line. I'm going to drop the lightning strikes on here and it becomes even more <laughs> dramatic. Look at all that lightning and uh, with these storms, some of them on the stronger side or even severe, we did have some severe thunderstorm warnings earlier. It's primarily a situation with damaging winds, wind gusts over 90 kilometers an hour and that large hail, uh, but isolated tornadoes, not out of the question as I was saying yesterday when I was talking about the setup for this particular system. So now moving off to even the east of Chatham-Kent, but the area you see here in yellow, which still includes Windsor and is basically kind of western Middlesex uh, County here, um, just to the west of London, where the severe thunderstorm watch is still in place. So conditions favorable uh, for these storms to become strong or become severe. So it is breaking up a little bit and it will continue to weaken as it moves eastward. Left behind, we're still likely going to have a bit of drizzle, perhaps a bit of fog at first, but that should be gone uh, as we go through the overnight hours, but still that bit of drizzle. And then we'll see some improving conditions, at least partly <laughs> improving, uh, and for a little bit as we go into tomorrow. So I'm going to kind of walk you through that. This is tomorrow morning, uh, getting off to an okay start, probably still a lot of cloud cover around. It's into the afternoon that I see us getting more sunny breaks and maybe even becoming a mix of sun and clouds. So getting more sunshine through, that's going to help the temperature uh, as well. But the winds will still be breezy from the west. And then Thursday night, another pocket uh, is going to be coming through. So that right now, the timing really seems like Thursday night into Friday morning. So yes, some rain on Friday morning, but if you're just looking at your phones, uh, you'll see a rain icon. And I don't anticipate that being all day Friday because here, this is 11 a.m. and we're already starting to clear out behind that. So by Friday afternoon, I'm hoping that we do get some sunshine coming in. So not an awful day, certainly. And Saturday, not awful either. <laughs> Actually looking pretty good. There'll be another trough, but that should stay to the north may even bring some flurries into uh, cottage country. So the winds have been gusty, especially when those storms were going through. Some of those gusts over 55 kilometers an hour. Uh, through tomorrow morning, they'll be a bit stronger. And then from the west, they, they essentially will be backing off. 
The rainfall, even tonight with some of this drizzle, we could see, or a little more than drizzle at times, five to 10 millimeters. But then I want you to know that we get that break. It's then as we go towards uh, Thursday night into Friday, we could see that 18 to about 25 millimeters. Uh, mild temperatures overnight tonight, nothing to worry about there. Uh, should get improving conditions for Thursday, so I'm really holding on to that one for us, Meg. Thanks so much for that, Colette. You're welcome. An attempt to revisit the controversial naming decision of a Kingsville school failed last night. During a board meeting, trustee Linda Chin wanted to examine the, examine the naming procedure, saying she wanted to improve public confidence, but the chair didn't allow the motion to proceed. The uh, opinions that are stated at the beginning of the motion are totally inappropriate. We don't allow notices of motion to state opinions. Um, which are points of debate, uh, so that's totally inappropriate. Trustees initially decided to call it Erie Migration Academy, that name put forward by trustee Julia Burgess. Despite a naming committee selecting other names, that prompted serious backlash from the community. The school was then renamed to Erie Migration District School. Board Chair Gail Simcoe Hatfield sent out a statement today saying that debate is over and she wants people to be positively engaged in the success of the education system moving forward. Last night, trustees also voted in favor to look at ways to keep running tracks open at some of its schools. Previously, they decided to close four high school tracks. It would cost $2.2 million to remove them compared to $5 million to repair. Administration is exploring options with community partners to keep the tracks open. I do have some experience. Uh, related to tracks um, and my experience is that um, despite promises that tracks will last 10 years they don't um, and they're very expensive and we're unfunded but and I listen I, I love the idea of having tracks it's not I'm not anti-track at all um, but what I am very cognizant of is the fact that our administration already did a report we have budget coming up there are concerns surrounding the Canadian government's plans to scrap the GED, a test people could take to get the equivalency of a high school diploma. The provinces have until May 3rd to agree on a new replacement test, but some aren't optimistic the government will meet the deadline. When you are looking for answers, answers that directly impact your present day and future, and not only that, but your potential earning capabilities to support your family, to support yourself, that is greatly disturbing. Education Minister Stephen Lecce recently said Canadian ministers of education are working on a replacement test. He says the government has been in works with them to make sure that gets initiated and says Ontario is taking initiative in this respect to make sure that there's seamless completion. A feeling of joy, being able to grant a wish for someone and a Windsor man has been able to do that 60 times. He's a volunteer with Make-A-Wish Foundation at the charity that grants wishes to sick children. He's also led fundraising efforts that have brought in more than $20 million for the foundation. That's why the organization has chosen Jim Scott to be this year's Volunteer of the Year. He spoke with Windsor Morning host Amy Dodge. Evan, who's a really cool guy, uh, he wanted to meet Selena Gomez and I thought, uh, oh boy, that's going to be <laughs> that's going to be a tough task. And uh, we were back and forth trying to put a wish together. Uh, finally, she was coming to the Palace of Auburn Hills, which obviously is now no longer there. And uh, we went to, we went to the concert, and we were going to meet her uh, at her in her dressing room. Prior to that, and we kept you know getting impatient. And when when is she going to come see us? And I kept calling the number at the you know her security, and the guy kept telling me to be quiet and sit tight or something. So. Devin was getting really anxious, and uh, finally we, we got down to her dressing room, and she was wearing a, a, a black uh, sports outfit, and, and her team was trying to rush her on, and she said, I'll take as much time with Devin as I want, and uh, an incredible, an incredible wish, and uh, we ended up sitting up in, in great seats and, and listening to her sing songs, and I think Devin sung every single word of every single song, so really, really a wonderful opportunity. Unfortunately, we see it around downtown, plywood that's been put up in place of a broken window. 
Made in Lane Wine and Spirits recently had to do that after a break in, but two artists swooped in to turn what was an ugly encounter into a beautiful mural. It's sad to see, you know, a boarded up window. My skill is art, so the least I could do is to offer to paint it. We got a call from our security system company at about 5.20 uh, in the morning. So we jumped in the car, ran down here, um, and we found a broken window and some stolen goods. It was traumatizing and this has never happened to us before. That night they were launching a new menu and of course I wanted to go. And I was there, I talked to Mark and Sarah and I said, you know, hey, would it be okay if I painted over it? The design I came up with was inspired by their menu. To the left, there's a bunch of tinned fish and they're smiling because they're happy, of course. To the right, we have an oyster and we also have garlic and there's olives. In the center, there's an orange slice along with some cheese, some snap peas, and along the top, there's some wiggly little cocktail glasses that I thought would tie it all together. It took about two and a half days, about 20 hours in total. It's heartwarming and shocking. You know, it, it teaches us a lesson that there's good people out there still. Yeah. There's always lots to look forward to in early spring, but back in 1984, it was the smelt run that captured lots of attention. Hundreds of locals after those small silver fish that would show up on the shores. Former CBC Windsor reporter Janice Stein with this report. It wasn't just the smelt who were running. Americans were coming over the Ambassador Bridge in droves, and they were all heading for Point Pelee. The cars were loaded with waiters and pails and people in caps. But their first stop in Canada was the beer store to load up with more supplies. It was going to be a long night. Out towards Point Pelee, the lineup of cars started in Leamington. By the time we reached the park, 600 people had already gone through the gates. Almost every foot of the shoreline had been staked out. People were bundled up in traditional smelt fishing gear. And the fishing, well, it was slow but everyone was having a good time anyway. How long it's you... fun. How long like you... they say in a book, it, uh, all the clowns go smell fishing. Evidently when they start running, they start down here, you can hear them. everyone says they're running, they're running, and it comes all the way down to the end. And that's when everyone gets fun, has fun. And that first sign that the smelt are running is what everyone here is ready and waiting for. Janice Stein, CBC News, Point Pelee. A whistleblower today testified in front of a U.S. congressional committee about the safety of planes manufactured by Boeing. We have the details coming up.
A whistleblower today testified in front of a U.S. congressional committee about the safety of planes manufactured by Boeing. The American company has many clients around the world, including Canada's two biggest airlines. Between them, Air Canada and WestJet fly more than 250 Boeing planes. Journalist Benji Heyer has the story. Well, this was damning from Sam Selipour. He alleges his employer is putting defective airplanes in the sky. As a quality engineer at the plane maker, he identified gaps between key sections of the fuselage of the 787 Dreamliner, which he says are not properly fastened. In other words, they could literally break apart. In front of a Senate investigations subcommittee, one of two Boeing-related hearings in Congress today alone, Mr. Selipour highlighted how shortcuts have been taken that he believes were not addressed nearly 100% of the time. He claims Boeing has, quote, no safety culture. He says he was ignored, sidelined, threatened by his superiors. He feared physical violence for going public with his concerns. And he insists all 787s should be grounded, admitting he wouldn't take his own family on one. He was joined by another whistleblower, Ed Pearson, a former manager on the 737 program, who hit out at Boeing's actions, calling them a criminal cover-up. He told senators that Boeing illegally stopped conducting thousands of quality control inspections without the knowledge of airlines. Now, Boeing maintains that such allegations about its plane's structural integrity are, quote, inaccurate and it's also dismissing another of the whistleblowers accusations that workers on the factory floor were seen literally jumping on parts of the fuselage on the triple seven planes to make them aligned. Boeing still faces a criminal investigation by the Department of Justice here and separate investigations by the Federal Aviation Administration and the National Transportation Safety Board. Benji Hire for CBC News, Washington. Coming up, an artist has gone all out for Earth Day. We show you their creation after the break.
The NBA has banned Toronto Raptors player Jonte Porter for life. It comes after an investigation into gambling allegations. The league found that Porter violated a number of rules concerning betting and including disclosing sensitive information to sports bettors. CBC's Jamie Strashen has the latest. John T. Porter has thrown away his NBA career, banned for life. The league says he bet on NBA games, including games involving the Raptors. You don't want this for our team and we don't want this for our league. Um, that's, uh, that's, that's for sure. My first reaction is obviously surprise because you, none of us, uh, I don't think anybody saw anything like this. Uh, coming. A league investigation revealed Porter tipped off bettors about confidential information and limited his play for betting purposes. The NBA also says Porter made thousands of dollars betting on at least 13 NBA games, including a bet on the Raptors to lose. He didn't play in any of those games. In a statement, Commissioner Adam Silver said Porter's actions compromised the league's integrity which is why Jonte Porter's blatant violations of our game rules are being met with the most severe punishment. There is gambling commercials and all that stuff that's going on with the league right now, but they cannot stand for someone who's betting on the games themselves. It's just a no-no. Doesn't go Porter. That's it in with a left hand. And it was a suspicious bet involving Porter that cued this investigation. A gambler made an $80,000 bet that would pay out up to a million dollars if Porter didn't achieve a certain number of points, rebounds, and assists. Porter played three minutes in that game before pulling himself out with an illness. The bet was not paid out and was reported. I mean, the sports book might have chose not to take that bet previously, but they wouldn't have to report it to the league. There would be no additional actions that were taken, but because of regulated gaming, this was able to be caught. The NBA was the first major U.S. league to advocate for legalized and regulated betting, but still acknowledged today there are issues. Porter is the 18th player banned for life by the NBA, the first for gambling. Jamie Strachan, CBC News, Toronto. The Big Apple is now home to a big pile of plastic waste. It's in the form of an installation meant to mark Earth Day, which is five days away. Artist Benjamin Von Wong created the sculpture to draw attention to the plastic pollution problem. So this art installation is inspired by the Greek legend of the Hydra, which is when you cut one head off, two more spread out. And I feel like it's very emblematic of the single-use plastic problem. We think we can solve it through recycling or cleanups, but then like another problem pops up, like, oh, we're not recycling enough. The pile includes dozens of single-use plastic contain containers, laundry detergent jugs, body wash containers, and lotion pump bottles. The containers are spray-painted gray and so-called tentacles with large-scale mirrors emanate from the center. Von Wong hopes his exhibit inspires viewers to make a small change, like using refillable products to help reduce plastic pollution. Well, that's it for CBC Windsor News. Don't forget, for news anytime, you can go to our website at cbc.ca slash Windsor. Thanks so much for tuning in. Looking forward to seeing you back here tomorrow night.